Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar with BB Financial Services, in which we are giving a simple guide to raising export finance using the value of an invoice. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I am the Senior Content Editor at the Institute of Export and International Trade. Open to Export is a free online service helping small businesses get ready to sell overseas for our step by step articles and guides, regular webinars our export action plan tool and our quarterly competitions. You can find out about all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's professional membership body for traders, endorsed by the World Trade Organization and the International Chamber of Commerce as a small business champion. We offer a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees and an always exciting and prestigious program of events celebrating UK businesses exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session and you can ask questions at any point during the webinar using the question box on the control panel to the right hand side of your screen. Today, we are joined by Yvonne from Bibi. She's their head of operations, and she'll be um, talking about financial solutions for businesses who are new to exports. So over to you, Yvonne. Thank you very much, Will. And thank you, everybody, for joining this afternoon. Uh, indeed, I'm going to talk about invoice finance as a solution for uh, funding your export invoices. You can go to the next slide, please. And maybe over one more again. Thank you. This is what we're going to be talking about today. So I will introduce to you a little bit about Bibi Financial Services, talk about the challenges exporters face and how um, invoice finance can support those uh, challenges and help you overcome them. Have a little bit, look at the export market, uh, some of our uh, key findings from the research that we take, a couple of case studies um, introduce you to our export team, and hopefully answer any questions, as Will said, either as we go through the presentation, or if you want to save them to the end, then that's fine. Next slide. So a little bit about uh, Bibi Financial Services. We're the leading independent uh, financial partner for UK business, supported by our parent company, the Bibi Line Group, who have been going since 18,007. You can see from here that we're um, involved in a range of industries from logistics to retail and, of course, to uh, financial services. Next slide, please. So we are the leading independent financial services partner, UK business. Importantly, we support over 9,500 business customers worldwide. We have more than 1,200 employees worldwide to help support this, and importantly, a network of 40 offices in 14 countries across the globe. And what's more important, particularly when looking at today's presentation, we are able to fund in over 120 export destination countries. We have a team of experts to keep your business moving, and we fund anything from startups to nationwide to international companies and are able to offer a truly global solution to your business funding requirements. Next slide. So how can invoice finance help your business? It's ideal for businesses where customers have longer payment terms. If you're already an exporter or you're going into export, you will know that more often than not, your customers are looking for a payment term that exceeds 30 days from invoice date, 30 days from end of month. Sometimes those customers will pay late. And each of those issues on their own go towards creating a cash flow uh, gap when it comes to uh, wanting to pay suppliers or maybe paying your staff because you're waiting longer to get your invoices paid. Invoice finance can also help businesses who want to take on new projects and do that without taking on extra debt. And so how do we do that exactly? Next slide, please. 
So what is invoice finance and how does it work? This is a, a fairly simple example of an invoice finance process. Our clients invoice a customer or a debtor for goods sold, and the client will send that invoice to the invoice financier. Uh, perhaps I will just say at this point, we know that there are other invoice financiers in the marketplace, um, and hopefully all of them should be able to offer the kind of things that we're talking about today. Typically, once an invoice is received, the financier will offer up to 85% of the value of the invoice immediately. Now, when that invoice comes to mature, the invoice financier can chase that invoice for payment, or the client may opt to do that themselves. We appreciate that many businesses have their own robust credit control departments, and we don't want to mend anything that isn't broken. So if that suits your business and you already have a credit control department in place, then we'd be happy to leave that in place and let our clients do their own collection activity. When the customer or debtor pays the invoice financier, the amount on the invoice, uh, either directly to us or into a trust account, the balance, which in this example is 15%, is then paid to the client. We'll fund up to 10 million pounds funds out. And importantly, when we're looking at export, at the type of uh, businesses, the profiles of the businesses that we will fund, 100% export ledger funding. So if you're not selling into the domestic market, or if that debt is already ring fat fenced and you're comfortable with the way that you're operating your domestic business, you might just want to pass over the export book particularly if it's something new for you. We fund single debtor relationships, looking at new start businesses, where maybe to begin with, they've only got one or two or three customers. Um, we are comfortable in uh, providing funding against single debtor businesses, usually against the support of something we call bad debt protection, which I will talk about a little bit later on. We're talking about speed here as well, because obviously that, that's really important to our exporters. You're getting your invoices paid more quickly, 85% immediately. So we give you the opportunity to earn discounts from suppliers that you can pay early. We also offer you an expert specialist service in our credit control. So when those invoices do mature, we can use local language capability to collect those debts very efficiently and very professionally as soon as they become due for payment. We know that many businesses want to keep their funding facilities discreet. We understand that. We can seek invoice payment on behalf of your company. We can do it over the telephone and quite often our clients will set our credit controllers up on their own email address so that we can email your customers directly uh, without giving any indication that, in fact, an invoice finance company is involved. We like to keep it simple. We hope it's convenient. We have a raft of experience in dealing with payment terms, languages. We have over 13 languages in our export department at the current time, time zones. I mentioned at the beginning that we had 14 offices around the world. So that's one in the UK, and 13 in Europe, we have a couple in Southeast Asia, and we're also well represented in North America. Currency is also extremely important. We know from all the data that we collect, and, and this will come up several times during the presentation, that exporters worry a lot about currency fluctuation, and that many of our Clients uh, get stung by currency irregularities. Maybe they're invoicing on 60 day terms. So, on day one, when they send out the invoice, they are expecting to get a certain amount back in uh, GBP if they've invoiced in an overseas currency. But when the money comes in, the uh, exchange rate has fluctuated the wrong way and they're making a currency loss. And we appreciate how important it is. For companies to compete locally by invoicing in local currencies, so we do what we can to help mitigate that risk. 
Local customs, also very important that you understand the nuances of doing business in markets other than the UK. So with funding worldwide territories, with our language and time zone support, and importantly, security of bad debt protection, we believe that we have just what our clients need. Bad debt protection, if you've not come across that wording before, is the same as trade credit insurance. Many of you out there may have your own trade credit insurance policies. We provide a bad debt protection solution, which also covers economic and political risk cover. And this enables us to uh, fund those far reaching markets and those single customer relationships with a lot more um, comfort than you might otherwise find from the high street banks. But uh, we shall see. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So let's just uh, take a step back a moment and look at the challenges for exporters and maybe think about how you can tie that into an invoice finance facility. So why are businesses exporting? We uh, collect a lot of data, both from our own clients and for, from the exporting community at large through the other exporting organizations that we work closely to. And these would be the four reasons that, that we come up against mostly. That would be expansion, looking for increased profitability, because invariably you can charge more for an overseas invoice than a domestic one. Maybe a planned growth strategy where you've been looking at the markets that you want to get into, maybe having to tweak your product to meet that market or looking to provide services into other overseas markets, or indeed just an unexpected order. We have a lot of clients that are new to exporting that one day an export order came across the, the desk and they realized perhaps that this was um, a good opportunity uh, for expansion and for profitability for their business. I mentioned the data that we collect and that foreign currency fluctuations again and again with the list. But that's followed very closely by documentation and logistics management. You think about moving goods from Birmingham to London, the documentation and logistics management involved is nothing compared to what you might need to think about. If you're suddenly exporting goods from the port of London to Singapore, and it's about finding new customers, uh, new markets. How do you do that? Uh, is it through an agent, a distributor? Are you going to have salespeople on the ground going into a, a joint venture, maybe, in a market or opening up a local office? These things are expensive. But one thing we do say, particularly to our new exporting clients, if you're starting to work with an agent or with a distributor, do make sure that you have a contract or an agree with, agreement with them that's fit for purpose. It's okay at the front end while things are going well, but if you have an, uh, a verbal agreement with an agent and that relationship goes sour, suddenly when you go to collect your invoices, you find that that agent has been to your customers and has collected the funds against invoices as they mature in lieu of the commission that they think maybe they're not going to get paid. Or are they agreeing that customers can return goods when you have no such agreement and don't want goods to be returned unless there's a specific reason, which is in accordance with your terms and conditions of sale? But it's really important to make sure that you document any agreements that you have um, with representatives overseas. Access to cash and funding. Again, we know that when we look at our data, Businesses in the domestic market often are self-funding, but when it comes to the overseas market, they have a difficulty in finding a good partner providing them with the cash that they need. Extended delivery and payment terms, and we know that that has a, a direct link to the uh, cash flow gap and the access to funding then becomes all the more important. We usually say that if you have a customer that's perhaps North of the Loire Valley in France, the payment term is probably going to be still 30 days from invoice date or from uh, end of month. But go anywhere below there to southern Europe, go further afield to anywhere else in the rest of the world, and you're looking at anything from 45 days plus in terms of when your customers will want to settle their invoices. 
Local culture and legislation, really important. The legal jurisdiction and local legislation under which you'll be doing business is really something to think about. You need to have terms and conditions of sale which are fit for export purpose. It may well be that your customers are large nationals and they only want to do business against their own contracts or the terms and conditions of their own purchase orders, in which case, more than likely, the legal jurisdiction is going to be that of the customer and not that of the domestic market. That's all well and good, again, whilst things are going well, but if you ever have to go to arbitration or you ever need to take a customer to court, then all of a sudden it can become expensive and you start realizing things that perhaps you hadn't thought about before. If we, for example, say that you were going to take legal action in the United Arab Emirates, all your documentation would have to be translated into the local language by an approved translator of the court. Even though maybe they could speak English, you would have to have everything you say in court translated again by a translator that's approved by the court. You may have to stay there for several weeks incurring hotel bills, accommodation and food. If the case gets delayed, it becomes more expensive. And all of these things add up to, well, basically coming off the bottom line, off your profit. So really important to think about the local legislation and the terms and conditions that you agree to do business with when you're looking um, looking at exporting. Country risk as well, political and economic risk, that goes hand in hand with the bad debt protection that I mentioned previously. Not so much political risk, but we do see economic risk cover being used from time to time. If you're selling, for example, maybe to a business in a, a small island in the, in the Caribbean, and you're selling in um, obviously not the local currency, perhaps sterling or US dollars. When the customer comes to pay the invoice, he pays in local currency. That invoice then has to be approved by the national bank for the foreign currency to be paid. And if there is no currency available, that invoice may then sit in a, in a queue in the bank waiting for foreign currency to become available. That could be a waiting period of three, six, nine months, maybe even more. If you have economic risk cover, then the underwriter will ensure that you get paid more quickly. Next slide, please. So how can we overcome these challenges? Whether you're working with BFS or you're looking at other invoice finance providers, you need to make sure that they can all provide everything that you see listed here. So the 100% export ledger funding. If you don't sell in the UK, uh, we are happy to fund your sole export ledgers. I mentioned as well that if you only have one or two customers to begin with, we don't have a problem with that. Our team uh, in our export head office in Banbury are experts. They understand INCO terms. They understand the nuances when you're coming to export, um, time zones, obviously, and our language capability. So we're able to support our clients through the complexities of selling overseas. When it comes to foreign exchange, I mentioned that we have our own foreign exchange business. We are able to provide preferential spot rates as well as forward contracts. And it's really important that you spend some time investigating uh, how you can mitigate um, currency fluctuations when you're going to invoice in currencies other than sterling. And certainly at some point in time, you probably will need to do that if you're going to compete well in the local market. Receive funding and support wherever in the world your customers are. Now, I must add a caveat to that because obviously there are UN sanctioned and EU sanctioned markets which we are unable to fund. Our business in terms of invoice finance is about being able to fund into those markets where open account trading is acceptable. The bad debt protection, very important. It allows our clients to trade confidentially, knowing that customer non-payment or insolvency won't affect your business. And again, the languages and the time zones. Next slide, please. 
So let's have a look at a little bit about the export finance market. We know that there are around 322,000 exporters in the UK, with 27% of them having a turnover of more than £1 million. The main sectors that we see, manufacturing, wholesale, transport and warehousing. But I do have to add to that manpower. We are seeing a much increase in uh, clients coming to us in the oil and gas industry, technical manpower. Maybe this is an area that perhaps previously in Scotland, uh, going out into the North Sea, business was very prevalent. That business has been lost somewhat. And we're seeing businesses coming to us looking for funding for putting technical experts out into Africa, into South America, and into Southeast Asia. We know that businesses uh, that export are more likely to be looking for finance and have a greater ambition to grow. And again, the biggest challenge is that we keep uh, repeating because they're so important, the currency fluctuations and cash flow. There are 8,200 export businesses currently using invoice finance. So if it's a route that you chose to go down, then certainly you wouldn't be alone. Uh, the next slide, please. This is some of, of our key findings. We send survey requests out to our clients regularly and those other partners, exporting organizations that we work with, we exchange data and we come up with what we believe is some fairly solid and factual information about exporting from the UK. If you look at the top export destinations, if, for example, you wanted to add another couple of countries into there, then Ireland and the Netherlands would certainly be in the top five. And those five countries uh, can swap places from, from time to time. We know that 50% of the top 20 export destinations for SMEs are in the EU currently. So I guess now wouldn't be a bad time to have to mention Brexit. Uh, we are very um, concerned about what's going to happen over the next couple of weeks. And we are trying uh, to keep a, our clients abreast of information as we receive it. If you look at the bottom of the slide, the last time we surveyed our clients, 37% thought that it was um, a bad thing. 35% thought there would be no change. Uh, and 17% still felt that it was too early to tell. And indeed, uh, I think the next two weeks are going to be very telling as to how uh, Brexit will work out for our exported community from the UK. The top three challenges, the currency fluctuations, logistics, Inco terms, we understand that if you're new to exporting, then Inco terms, other than perhaps work that you may have been used to, uh, can be fairly difficult to understand to begin with. Where risk transfers, what you have to pay for, what your customer should pay for, whether you're paying for insurance or not paying for insurance, many things to consider. And the paperwork and administration. Uh, there are lots of organizations that we work with, and I should mention, I guess, now immediately open to export and the Institute of Export that give excellent support in uh, talking about the nuances of paperwork and administration. And of course, the Institute of Export have some really good export knowledge courses. So if you're new to exporting and you have a, a small team back in the office, and you want to give them a good grounding in exporting, then do look at the Institute of Exports website with regards to education. Can I have the next slide, please? I'm going to bring you a couple of case studies here. The first one, our client Silent Sentinel Limited. They are a design and manufacturer of leading surveillance and security systems. They've got offices around the world, in the US, Singapore, and Jordan. And we structured a deal for them last year, which included international payment collection and language support. They found that was very important for them, that they were struggling to collect their debts, that their um, Day sales outstanding was extending because they have difficult, had difficulties with the, with the languages. 
and indeed time zones when it came to getting paid. We do understand that at the front end of any transaction, and you're speaking to the owners of the business or perhaps to the buying team, they may well speak English. Yet when it comes to the back end of the transaction, when you're trying to get paid and speaking to the account payable department, we appreciate that they may not all speak English and then it becomes difficult. And these were the kind of problems that our client was having. As you can see here, Paul Ellsley explains that, that exporting doesn't come without its challenges. They were looking for a funder that could help them overcome some of the complexities around credit terms, payment practices, legal and language barriers. And we have fulfilled that for our client and is in it enabling them to grow and fulfill orders that they weren't able to do so in the past. Next slide, please. Our other case study is around a client called Waven, who is in the apparel industry. We have a fair few apparel clients, and it's no secret for me to be able to say to you that uh, one of our clients is the uh, business that designed and made Meghan Markle's wedding dress. So we're providing them, as we are this company, uh, the working capital funding that they need to grow. Um, to the extent that our other client believes that they will grow on the back of the marvellous um, marketing campaign that they've had from, from making that particular dress. Uh, this is what Annika had to say about um, selecting Bibi. Uh, in order to take the business to the next level, they needed working capital funding, they need to, de to develop new lines and expand their reach overseas. And we've given the um, flexibility and certainty of payment to allow them to do that. Next slide, please. So I talked about uh, a few times about the partners that we use when we're gathering information. And these, these are those organizations. So we have the Institute of Export and uh, Open to Export with whom we work very closely throughout the year. Also the British Chamber of Commerce and the Department for International Trade. If you want any information on new markets that you're thinking of going into, the Department for International Trade, for example, has a good website where you can look up the various markets. Uh, we work closely with the British Exporters Association and importantly, we carry out our own research. At the bottom of the slide here, you will see some of the publications that we have, which you can download from our website. Uh, last year we had a global business monitor. We have something called the SME confidence tracker that comes out once a quarter and shares very um, interesting and important information about what we're being told is happening in the uh, domestic and international marketplace. And another um, a magazine that we have called Trading Places, which again is full of uh, useful information about how our product can support international trade. Next slide, please. And this is our team. I think it's important for anybody to know um, the business that you're going to be working with. Uh, Jim Davis, our managing director, has been with Bibi for over 10 years. I have only been with Bibi for four and a half years, but have almost 30 years in export trade finance. We have relationship managers. So if you sign up with Bibi Financial Services, very quickly after you've had your first payment, your relationship manager would be coming out to visit you, to talk about the relationship, to talk about our online system, how you can sign invoices and uh, make requests for payment. They will visit you as often as you need them to visit you, but certainly they'll be there at least once a year and also always on the end of the telephone if you have any uh, questions that you need answering. We have a client service management team based in our office in Banbury. The client service manager is there for our clients every day to talk about payments, to talk about invoices that have been assigned, any issues that the client may have, or information has been passed back to us from the customers. We have a credit control team, as I've mentioned, with the language capability. 
most of our credit controllers speak more than one language and we're sharing about 13 languages, I believe, for the current time. We have a risk management team that look at the risk of, of um, the client and, and importantly of the client's customers, a regional sales director and a business development sales team that supports our client with the onboarding process. We have a marketing team which helps get our message out into the marketplace and importantly, the product team that makes sure that we have the right product and that it's flexible and fit for purpose for exporting businesses. That brings me to the end of our actual presentation. Um, and I would like to invite you please to um, give me any questions that you think you might have or will if any questions have been passed to you during the presentation, um, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Great, yeah, many thanks, Yvonne, for um, yet another great presentation. Um, and I hope everyone has found that useful for sure. Um, as Yvonne noted, we are going to open the floor for questions now. So please do ask questions using the control panel on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask is from Eddie, and he's asking about um, can, how do you find out um, what support is available to export to certain markets? And in his case, he's asked about Mongolia. Um, but kind of more broadly, how do you find out kind of um, specific markets information? Okay, the, the Department of uh, International Trade is a good place to start. They, you can go onto their website, you can put in the country that you're, you're looking to investigate, and they will bring up information regarding the local commercial office in that market, maybe some of the difficulties in that market, what's easy in that market, the kind of product perhaps that a particular market might be looking for, and whether they have um, any trade visits that they may have planned to a particular market. So I would say that that's a good place to, to start. Um, that's a very specific, uh, almost slightly unusual market. So if, um, if there are inquiries from that market, the things that I think you have to look, at, look for, and again, in any, any new market you're looking into, if it's a product that you're selling, make sure that that product can be sold as it is in that market and it doesn't need amending in any way that you don't need to have any special labels um, if it's food stuff or anything perishable that you've got the right certifications and actually just by going and, and googling maybe going into the british chamber of commerce or again of course the institute of export there are so many export support organizations out there that will help you with the information that you read, the, you need to get your product right for the markets that you've chosen or the markets that have chosen you. Great, thank you, Yvonne. And um, as mentioned, the Institute does have our doing business guides, which are basically little snapshot guides into different markets, which you can find online um, on our site. So I'll post a link to those afterwards. Um, I've had a question in from Irene, who's from Peru, and she's asked, do you support companies importing into the UK as well? Uh, we don't, not from the UK. The, uh, we can only fund companies in the UK that are registered companies in the UK. So where we have offices around the globe, uh, those offices can do the same. So unfortunately, we don't have representation in Peru. But we have representation, as I've mentioned before, in North America, United States and Canada, Hong Kong, Singapore, several markets in Europe. Um, all of those um, individual businesses can fund companies in those markets that we cannot fund outside of those uh, individual territories. It has to be it has to be registered in that market. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and we've had a question in from Sam, and it's, it's a point you brought up a few times, Yvonne, it's around currency. And he's just asking generally, what kind of what advice would you give for companies looking to mitigate the risk of currency flux? Fluctuations? Well, you definitely, you definitely need to be working with, with an FX business, a company that, that can provide you with good rates, uh, perhaps give you a forward contract so that you know when you're going into exporting and you've got longer terms of payment, 
that you have an idea of how much sterling you're going to get back if you want sterling at the end of the day. Or maybe, in fact, your invoice is in sterling and you need to pay your suppliers in currency. Again, if you're having to buy currency, you want to make sure that that's at the best rate possible. If you do have an FX company and you don't have to be an invoice finance client to actually access that company. So if you look at the Biddy Financial Services website and look at our foreign currency business, you could get all the information that you need to talk to them. What we usually say is that if you've had two or three currency transactions that you've maybe just done on spot, perhaps with your bank, if you share those transactions with us, then we will have a look and we'll be able to tell you what we would, what rate we would have given you and what sterling and or maybe currency you would have received. And you can compare that with what the actual transaction was. And we find that that's a good way of, of measuring whether the um, foreign exchange service we offer is, is as good as or better or not as good as what you may have at the moment. Great, thank you. And, and uh, the, the question of uh, Sam has also asked: Is it the same? Do you do the same for importing as well? We don't. We we on the foreign exchange side, uh, yes, we can. We do have um, a trade finance uh, business as part of uh, what we call specialist products. So within our specialist products, we have invoice finance for exporters. We also have a trade finance or if you like a purchase finance uh, business for companies that are importing from overseas, you don't have to be importing the goods. They could be goods going from the UK to the UK. Um, but certainly we do have a trade finance facility and again, details of which are on our website. Thank you. And um, in reference to an earlier question, someone called uh, Kevin wrote in, um, I think it's in the market information question. Uh, he's written it to say that the IT have regional offices with local advisors who have who are all from a commercial background and can advise as well. So thank you for That's watching right. there, Kevin. Yeah. Um, we've had a question in from Wojciech, and I think it's just looking to kind of explain the process a little bit. So he's given the example of a company who wants to buy some goods from a company and then sell them on Amazon. How would Bibby support his company in that situation? Well, if it's his company uh, selling to Amazon, then we do have clients that sell to Amazon. And we do recognize that sometimes their contracts or terms and conditions of purchase are onerous. And so sometimes we have to make reserves for things like volume discounts, um rebates uh return of goods volumes and things like that amazon can be it can be tricky and it does depend on which amazon you're dealing with because the terms and conditions that they buy with are not the same for every single market one uh piece of caution i suppose if amazon is your main customer that sometimes, unfortunately, um, businesses get the type of contract where it can be sale of sale or return, or there can be a lot uh, a lot of returns for uh, whatever the reason may be. So you think that you're about to get paid by Amazon, you get a remittance advice, it lists down half a dozen invoices, and you're expecting to get paid maybe I don't know ten thousand pounds. You look down the bottom and you discover that actually uh, Amazon are saying, no, there's um, too many debit notes, so we're not paying you, and you actually you owe us £3,000. Now, that might correct itself going forward in the next remittance advice, but we do, we do understand all those nuances that there are with Amazon contracts. They're not the easiest of companies to do business with. Yet at the same time that we acknowledge that if a, if a client is able to get a contract with Amazon, that can mean a lot of money for them. So we do support as best we can. I think the important thing here is that you have to look at the individual um, contract or terms and conditions that Amazon are offering to you for that product. Great, thank you, Yvonne. And I think on that note, the questions are, are starting to dry up now. So um, on that note, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you once again, okay. Yvonne, for another great webinar. You're welcome. Thank you very much.
So looking ahead to 2019, the Institute of Export and International Trade has just announced a series of new training courses for businesses looking to advance in export or to prepare for Brexit, including courses on customs declarations and procedures, customs classifications and tariff codes, rules of origin, and plenty more. Um, furthermore, you can apply for some government funding now towards many of our courses as of early December. This funding was announced last week and is designed to support businesses who are or will be required to make customs declarations in the, new in the near future. Um, obviously, this will be a key preparation for um, whatever Brexit may turn out to be. Information can be found about our training at export.org.uk forward slash training. And you can read about the funding as well on our blog at export.org.uk forward slash news. We recently launched our 10th Export Action Plan competition, a great chance for SMEs in the UK to win £3,000 towards their export plans. The competition is being sponsored by Bibi, and the deadline to enter is January 25th next year. Information can be found on the URL stated on the slide there, and we definitely encourage you to enter that because it's a really good opportunity, so please do have a look. Our next webinar, indeed our final webinar of 2018, is on December 14th and that will include some tips for companies looking to enter the competition as well as some information about the Institute's new package of support for new exporters entitled Buccaneers Guide to Export Success. We'll also be hearing from a couple of really inspiring case study exporters in the webinar, so I definitely recommend signing up to what is our, turning out to be our annual case study webinar. Details can be found at opentoexport.com forward slash webinars, and we will circulate a link to that too in the follow up to this webinar. But finally, as always, please do take our exit survey to let us know what you thought of today's session and to give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. Many thanks. Goodbye.